Welcome to the NHL Wraparound Podcast, featuring Neil Smith, President, General Manager of the 1994 Stanley Cup champion New York Rangers, and longtime ESPN NHL veteran Vic Morin. Together, they share no-nonsense opinions on news and issues around the National Hockey League. Whether you're a casual or diehard fan, each episode of NHL Wraparound will leave you more informed. Now, here's your hosts, Neil and Vic. Welcome to NHL Wraparound, our fourth and final summer cooler. We have knocked out the Atlantic, Metropolitan, and Central Divisions. Today, it is time for the Pacific. And, Neil, I think before we get started, one thing is pretty certain here. As we come into the new season, it's going to be Edmonton, Vancouver, and everybody else. I think so, because I don't think that uh, I, I, I think Vegas is still strong. Uh, and uh, but I don't think there is perhaps as strong as those two. And L.A. will continue to battle hard because they always do with uh, their big guns. But let's get into it. All right, we're going to be doing just some quick snapshots on last season in terms of point total, playoff advancement. Then we'll go into player movement, and there is a ton here to talk about. And then we'll get into some discussion points. Now, in the first three shows, we went in the order of the standing from last year. We're going to break from protocol on this one. And now we're going to start off with the Edmonton Oilers because there is just so much to unpack here. They had the 2 nine in one start. It cost Jay Woodcroft his job. Chris Knobloch came in, gets them all the way to the final. They finish in second place with 104 points and en route to the championship round against Florida and knocked out the Kings, the Canucks, and the Dallas Stars. But let's first look at player personnel. So I'm going to start with the players that they lost before going to those that have come in. So they lost Ryan McLeod, trade to Buffalo. Warren Fogel, UFA to the Kings. Sam Carrick, UFA to the Rangers. Jack Campbell, who's really not in the future plans anyway, goes to Detroit. And then Project Vinny Dayarnay goes to the Canucks, who we'll be talking about shortly. And probably the biggest move here just took place recently with the offer sheets that the Blues tendered to Dylan Hathaway and Philip Broberg. And those sheets were not matched by the Oilers. So let's talk about this first. They did acquire Paul Fisher in a draft pick from the uh, from the Blues on the same day that they decided not to match the offer sheets. But there's a lot of loss here. And there's also uh, CeCe that they lost as well. Cody CeCe was traded to San Jose, yes. Yes, so uh, when you look at how many players that were on that Stanley Cup final team, um, there, there's a lot missing. And uh, don't forget that Evander Kane is going to start the season most likely on LTIR. So Evander- Which would actually help them in terms of the salary cap this year because we're going to get into that in a minute with uh, – couple of pretty big contracts on the horizon yeah but having said that that'll take away from their on ice uh product because evander kane is certainly a big part of their offense um a lot of a lot of players missing and i i i wonder how good they're already better offensively obviously than defensively and now they've taken a couple of a few hits on defense um how is uh, Chris Knobloch and Paul Coffey going to manage that with the the new six? Well, let's talk about the players that were added now. Um, they did do a handful of re-signs, maybe even more than that. Calvin Pickard in goal, Connor Brown right wing, Troy Stetcher on defense, Corey Perry re-ups, Matthias Janmark uh, re-signs as well. Uh, they also, uh, and also Adam Henrique, um, from the outside, they get Josh Brown from Utah, Victor Arvidsson from Los Angeles, and Jeff Skinner, 1,006 regular season games played, has never seen a postseason match in his entire career. I kind of like his odds this time around. Uh, yes, and defenseman Ty Emerson 
is also came into the Oilers this off season. So, um, yeah, I think that was a good pickup by uh, the Oilers and getting Jeff Skinner. I think they're paying him a million bucks on a one year deal. Um, he's got tremendous upside offensively. Although, as we just finished saying, is that what they really need? They need more offense, and that's what Jeff Skinner is. Um, I think their biggest uh, addition is obviously Victor Arvidsson. That's their their best player that they've added into the lineup. Um, good for Adam Henrique. He resigns again. Um, and uh, here we go. Stan Bowman replaced Ken Holland as the GM. And he gets right into the fire. He's got the offer sheets to decide whether or not he's going to match them, which subsequently he didn't. Didn't stop him from doing some business with that Fisher trade with St. Louis anyway. But He's got some real big work ahead. Leon Dreisaitl is in the final year of his contract, and Connor McDavid has two more years. So he's really got to watch the purse strings here. And right now, the Oilers are only $946,000 under the cap. So navigate that for us a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be very difficult. And this is, uh, you know, now Stan Bowman's opportunity to maybe show that he can handle the salary cap a lot better than he did when he was in Chicago. Um, and perhaps uh, that's unfair because his was the first team of the salary cap era to have players uh uh, franchise players with expiring contracts, uh, and Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taves back then and Duncan Keith. Um, now he's got, as you said, he's got, uh, uh Dreisaitl and McDavid to worry about Dreisaitl first. And rumor has it that Dreisaitl wants to leave Edmonton. Um, you know, he is a German national. He's not a Canadian. Uh, it's not like there's a ton of pressure on him to stay in Edmonton, um, uh, from his, from, his background, uh, perhaps he's uh, developed a lot of great friendships and 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 so on in Edmonton since he's been there. I certainly don't have any insight into any of that, but um, th those are big, big signings for the Oilers. And you know, you hope that for their sake that they won't have to gut some of the rest of the team to be able to pay those two players. Chris Knobloch did an absolutely phenomenal job getting buy-in from the Oilers when he took over for Woodcroft. Most specifically, I think the play away from the puck. I mean, the offensive pieces were there. The power play was absolutely extraordinary with Evan Bouchard just being phenomenal on the point. And of course, when you've got Dry Seidel, you've got McDavid, uh, you've got Zach Hyman who, uh, potted 54 this year or last season rather um so there's a lot there but the buy-in to the entire system was pretty strong do you see him able to keep that up in a new year as they try to take that one last step to winning a championship i i think he will be able to keep that up because i think his big guys is captain mcdavid and and dry as you mentioned and zach hyman no there's a formula to win now within the oilers they've, they've proven it they've got a formula why would they go away from that formula i think that um uh, Chris Knobloch and Paul Coffey will be able to institute the same plan again. It seems like there's a sense of urgency, not only with these two contracts coming up, but this is the second oldest club in the NHL. And having gotten so close last year, this is winter bust. I, yeah, it, it, it is. But um, I think they're, you know, the media and people like us can take a look at the long term thing. But if you're there, you don't look at that. You look at, okay, what are we doing for training camp? What are, who do we start the season against? What are the travel plans? And you take it, uh, you know, in small bites. Um, I don't think it's Stanley Cup or bust, but I do think that they've got to be a contender to make, to satisfy their fan base. Um, that they're for real. And if they're a contender and they lose in the, in the playoffs, well, I mean, that's happened to even better teams than this oiler team. So um, I, I just think they have to have a contending type season. 
And we'll see if that is enough to keep Dreisaitl in Edmonton beyond this season. So the team that actually finished first in the Pacific last year, the Vancouver Canucks, had 109 points, beat Nashville, and then lost to the Oilers in seven. Let's talk about their signings. Uh, they re-signed a half dozen players. Philip Ronick, Mark Friedman, Tyler Myers, and uh, on defense, Dakota Joshua. Big signing for them. I thought showed a lot of progress last year. Archers Philos, who became uh, a playoff hero, particularly in that Nashville series, and also for a little bit added support, Yuri Patera to uh, help support Stu Skinner and goal. Uh, they also signed as UFAs, Vinny DeHarnay from the Oilers that we just mentioned, and Daniel Sprong from Detroit. Uh, didn't lose a ton off the roster that they weren't able to replace. The biggest ones, Nikita Zadarov, the defenseman, and Elias and Lindholm go to uh, Boston as UFAs. And also uh, Ilya Mikheyev and Sarah Lafferty were traded to Chicago. But I got to tell you something, Neil, that when I went through all 32 of these teams and I tried to, to devote really an equal amount of time to each – and there was not a lot that I didn't like with this team. I think they have depth everywhere. And I'm not saying that they're going to win the Stanley Cup or they're even going to make the final. Or maybe they won't even get out of the division if they have to play Edmonton. But from what I could see heading into the season, this is the most complete club of the 32 that I looked at. Yeah, I think they've improved a very good team that they had last year. And I think their additions of DeBrusque, uh, seven year contract at five and a half. Um, also, I don't know if you mentioned Philip, uh, Honick signing the uh, long I deal. Did. I did. You did. Okay. Um, you know, I think that Daniel Sprong is good at one year. I, I, I liked him. Uh, Danton Heinen is, is good. Um, I, I do think their losses in Lynn Holman, Zadorov, uh, Casey DeSmith as a backup goaltender. Well, then they, um, they, they, they're going to have to worry though about uh, Thatcher Demko. He won't be at training camp. He's going to, he's injured. It's a knee issue. Um, they suddenly changed the title on their goaltending coach to goaltending scout. Now he's not going to be working with the goaltenders at home. So, um, I do, you got to read the tea leaves to know what that means, but it, it, do, it seems like there might have been a problem there between Demko and the goalie coach. Um, but overall, Vic, I like what they've done. They had to sign, um, uh, Joshua to that, to that contract. That was good. They got Myers redone for three years at three million. So I, I really like what they've done. I think they're going to be very, very good this year. And. Their only question mark will be their goaltending because uh, who knows when, when and if Thatcher Demko is coming back. Also, let's not forget some of the key players that, of course, already exist on this club. You know, Quinn Hughes, the uh, now defending Norris Trophy winner for top defenseman. JT Miller had a career high in points. Uh, now looks like Elias Patterson is finally settled and really comfortable there. And one signing that uh, I did not mention, you had mentioned Denton Heinen coming over from Boston. Also, Derek Forbert, former Bruin, and uh, Kiefer Sherwood, a UFA coming in from Nashville. So this team is strong. They're skilled. They're fast. I think they've got enough toughness as well. So... Having come so close, I mean, they played really well against the Oilers during the course of the regular season, really starting for the first two games of the season last year. And they managed to take the Oilers to seven games. They did have a 3-2 series lead and weren't able to close it. What do you see in terms of how a club gains confidence and grows from the experience that they went through? Well, it's it's all in the coaching and the leadership of the of the team. So uh, Quinn Hughes is their captain. He's a young captain, so he doesn't have a lot of playoff experience. Uh, Rick Tockett certainly has a lot of playoff experience and a Stanley Cup under his belt, um, and has been around a long time. So it's it's up to their coaching staff now to 
continue on from what they uh, learned last year, what works for them. It's much as the same as we were saying about Edmonton. Uh, they learned a lot about themselves and how to play the winning hockey. Uh, they didn't do it as much during the regular season as Vancouver did. This is Edmonton I'm talking about. But Vancouver certainly knew how to get through the regular season. And remember, too, with these two teams, they travel a bunch. I mean, Vancouver is uh, way out there, as we know, and the, and uh, you know that that's they go on big road trips. So they got they've obviously they figured that out last year and how to address that issue because there are a lot of things on the road. You know, team meals, uh, rest, um, uh, accommodations. Uh, when when is best to leave? Is it right after the game or do we wait for the next morning? Uh, all these kind of issues that, that go into the thought process of uh, the coach and how he's going to formulate travel. But uh, the Canucks have got to continue what they built on last year and keep it going this year. And if they're able to do that, they are a contender to get out of the West, I believe. Dust off your crystal ball for a second, and we'll revisit this sometime in the spring. Who advances further, the Oilers or the Canucks this coming season? Uh, I'm going to say the Oilers because they've done it once already. I don't question their goaltending, uh, and I do question the Canucks goaltending, but it's it's hard. I mean, the, the Canucks are are really good, but I I just think the Oilers are going to be the one to go further. And as we said, I think there's little question they're going to be 1-2 this coming season. So we're going to go to the third place team in the Pacific last season, the LA Kings, 99 points, lost in five games uh, to Edmonton in a series that was not terribly competitive. Uh, their key signings really started with their re-signs. Uh, Quinton Byfield, who uh, showed some real good promise last year, Trevor Lewis, Phoenix Copley and Goal and uh, Jordan Spence. They are all back under contract. Also from the outside, Warren Fogle comes in from the Oilers. Joel Edmondson from Toronto on defense. Jack Studnicka from Vancouver, who we did not mention a moment ago. And Caleb Jones, an unrestricted free agent defenseman from Colorado. They also acquired by trade Darcy Kemper. From Washington in the Pierre-Luc Dubois deal, uh, Tanner Janot from Tampa Bay and Kyle Burrows from San Jose. Off the roster, Matt Roy goes to the Capitals. Cam Talbot, UFA to Detroit. Blake Lazat goes to Pittsburgh. Victor Arvidsson, who we mentioned before, goes to Edmonton. Uh, Carl Grundstrom, a trade to San Jose. And the aforementioned Pierre-Luc Dubois goes to the Washington Capitals. So the first thing I want to hit on, because I've rose to Dubois pretty well so far, and I'm going to do it one more time. A lot of people were just lauding uh, Rob Blake from getting out from under this albatross of an eight-year deal. Uh, Dubois only played one year there. But uh, I guess uh, taking a look at it from the other side, why would he have signed this player in the first place? Well, they were trying to get all the potential that everybody had seen in him or when he was uh, coming into the league. Um, and he could make the excuse that things just didn't click for whatever reason in Winnipeg. And L.A. and their staff must have believed in this guy from from before Winnipeg. Uh, there's Otherwise, why would you give him this big, long contract? And so they gave him that. They rolled the dice and came up snake eyes. So... Um, you know, they, 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 they were lucky to be able to find a, uh, somebody that would, would want that contract and take another chance. So this will be the third team, uh, taking a chance on him. One name that I don't think you mentioned, Vic, is, uh, Turcott. They, uh, re-signed Turcott three years, 775 a year, which is a good deal. It is. And I, I think, you know, up front, there is certainly some decent forward depth there. I mean, I, I love Byfield uh, having, you know, his first 20 goal season. I'll be interested to see if he can continue that and maybe get up to 30 or 35. Uh, Adrian Kempe had 41 goals two years ago, dropped off a little bit uh, in this season uh, in terms of the goal scoring production. Uh, but overall, uh, I I like the club. I'd like their leadership uh, with an Anze Kopitar coming back once again. 
And I think that their goaltending is going to be a big question here with Kemper and Riddick and Copley. It'll be very interesting to see who really emerges as the true number one, because Kemper, of course, won a Stanley Cup with Colorado in 2022, but never seemed to be able to capture any of that magic in Washington. True. And I want to touch on one thing that is um, uh, sort of a a psychological thing. You'd have to you'd have to get a therapist in here to to tell us why this happens. But, uh, you know, you remember the Marc Andre Fleury situation in Pittsburgh where they uh, let him go uh, after he's won the you know, this two Stanley Cups and been first overall draft pick of theirs and uh, a real, uh, you know, great player for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And then he goes on to do great things in Vegas and and elsewhere and, and in Minnesota, excuse me, in Minnesota. And so you could be sitting back in Pittsburgh and saying, like, why did we ever let him go? He still would have been great here. Matt Murray didn't work out for us. So why do we let him go? And in L.A., Vic, have you ever thought about how good Jonathan Quick played for the New York Rangers last season in the backup role to Shesterkin? And now you look at the L.A.'s goaltending and say, boy, that, that's a real question mark for them. Why did they ever get rid of Jonathan Quick? And it's just sort of the same thing, right? The two-time Stanley Cup winner? Well, it, it, it is, but before Quick was let go, you could actually see his game starting to slide, and he had somewhat of a renaissance in New York. So to a degree, I do understand why they parted ways with uh, Jonathan Quick. So, um, again, that's going to be a very big question mark in uh, in the L.A. goal because I, I see that trio realistically in the bottom third of the league. So perhaps they prove us differently, but uh, not my, I'm, I'm not overall confident there. I'm going to get back to this subject later on in the show, uh, but they've got a rookie head coach too and Jim Hiller. He was only there for a couple of months as the head coach. He was there as an assistant coach. Apparently, um, the general manager, uh, Rob Blake, uh, liked what he saw and he re-signed him to be the head coach going forward. Um, but that's also, in my mind anyway, a little bit of a question mark until he proves that it shouldn't be. I think something to look out for also, they did finish third in the Pacific last year, but they were also 18-5-1 against non-playoff teams in the Western Conference. So there's an awful lot of bottom feeding that went on there. And I think of the 16 clubs that made the playoffs last season, they were probably the one that (laughs) underwhelmed me the most. And along with Washington, uh, you know, who got swept out by the Rangers, that was the one club that I felt had the least amount of chance to advance. And the way I look at this team in its totality is it's a club that is good enough to make the playoffs. But like the Red Wings in the middle part of last uh, the last decade, good enough to get in, not good enough to make noise once they get there. I would agree with you on that. Um, and their, their, their top players, uh, are, are aging and, and there's age catches up with all of us. And, uh, so Dowdy, who's a, had a fantastic career and has been a fantastic defenseman. And, uh, of course, Kopi Kopitar, their captain. Um, I mean, right now they seem like the ever ready bunnies that can go forever, but age does catch up to you as it did with, uh, Zetterberg in, in Detroit and, uh, Pavel Datsuk and, uh, even the great Nicholas Lidstrom. So it catches up to everybody. And, um, We'll see how, how how much it catches up to those guys this season with the L.A. Kings. I find Vegas to be a very intriguing story. They finished fourth last year, qualified as a wild card with 98 points and lost to Dallas in seven in the opening round. They lose Jonathan Marceso, the Consmite Trophy winner in 2023, Alec Martinez, UFA to Chicago, Michael Amadio, UFA to Ottawa, Anthony Mantha goes off to Calgary. Um, we already mentioned um, uh, Marceso, who signed with Nashville. Logan Thompson uh, is traded to Washington. Paul Cotter traded to New York. Will Carrier goes to Carolina. Chandler Stevenson to Seattle and Yuri Patera. 
uh, goes up to Vancouver. They did pick up Zach Aston Reese from Detroit, Ilya Samsonov from Toronto, Victor Olofsson from Buffalo, Pavel Duryev, uh, Kaden Korzak, and uh, are re-signed, and Robert Haig, uh, a UFA, comes in from Anaheim. Trade acquisitions are Alexander Holtz and Akira Schmid coming in from the New Jersey Devils. So from day one, Bill Foley, George McPhee, and Kelly McCrimmon going for it each and every year, probably stemming right off the amazing success that they had in their inaugural season, making the Stanley Cup Finals. They finally win the Stanley Cup in 2023. But now it feels like the credit card bill is coming due and they're entering the season down a bunch of players and they're still 3.64 over the cap. Yeah, and and, and you didn't mention uh, Noah Hannafin, who they got late last season. Correct. And they, Not during and the they, off and season, they signed him. Yes, later um, on Yep. To an eight-year deal at 7.35. Now, that'll take him until he's 35 years of age because he's 27 now. Uh, Samsonov uh, obviously uh, replaces Logan Thompson, who they lost. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I don't see – I looked at their lineup when we were doing this work. Uh I don't see how they can be as good as they've been with all those losses. Um, but you know, uh, Mark Stone and, uh, and, and his uh, group, uh, have surprised us in the past, but, um, they certainly don't look like they have the depth that they had last year and certainly not the depth they had the Stanley Cup year. Another player that uh, was actually joining the Vegas Golden Knights last year and did not appear until late in the season and in the playoffs was center Tomas Hurdle. Didn't make very much of an impact during the postseason, so it'll be interesting to see with a full season, back healthy, uh, how he performs. You know, one thing that we should mention, though, key injuries last season to this club. Mark Stone missed 20, uh, 26 games. He's the captain of the club. Jack Eichel, 19. Uh, uh, Shea Theodore, 35. Alec Martinez missed 27, even though he's not with the club anymore. And Zach Whitecloud missed 21. So that's 128 total games that you're missing from your regular lineup. So if they are able to be healthy, I think that this is still a good team. And I think it's a playoff team. And perhaps they catch a break simply because this is the weakest of the four divisions. Well, yes, and I, I do still think they're a playoff team. I, I there is, in my mind, there's no chance that they're going to miss the playoffs. But um, I don't think that they're the same. Look, if you've got Jack Eichel on your team, and you've got Tomas Hurdle on your team, and you've got Noah Hannafin signed up, and you know you're 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 going to make the playoffs. When I would speak to George McPhee last season, he told me that his club was very tired right from the get-go. They'd played more games than anybody in the league, uh, not only in their Stanley Cup run, but then when the season started the next year, they had a lot of games early. And um, I, I say to him, how's it going? He says, they're tired. They're just plain, flat-out tired. So let's see what it brings this year. Um, they got a good coach in Bruce Cassidy. Um, they, they already know the system that Cassidy's playing, and they're, they're, there'll be no surprises. Uh, let's see how their goaltending holds out. It's another place where we sort of question the goaltending. Um, they have a lot of goaltending depth, uh, but they need that one guy to step up and say, I'm for sure number one. And Aiden Hill has already done that. And let's see if uh, some more magic is in the offing for the new season. So that takes care of one through four in the Pacific Division. Just a reminder, our website, NHLWraparound.com, where you can get all of our episodes on both video and audio platforms. Welcome back to NHL Wraparound, the Pacific Summer Cooler. You know, we're going to hit the Calgary Flames, who have now missed the playoffs in consecutive seasons. Um, their real notable signings were Ryan Lomberg from Florida and Anthony Mantha coming from the Vegas Golden Knights. They also brought in Jake Bean from Columbus, a defenseman, and Martin Furk 
a right wing who has not played in the NHL since 21 and 22. They also added defenseman Kevin Ball in a trade for Jacob Markstrom. Uh, and speaking of Markstrom, he is one of the three uh, notable drops from this club for the new season, including Andrew Mangiapane, who was traded to Washington, and Dennis Gilbert, who signed as a UFA with Buffalo. Um, but I think now in net... Let's take a good look at Dustin Wolf, who will now get a chance for the number one spot with Markstrom gone, and he will be battling with uh, Dan Vladar. Yeah, and they, he got the new contract that uh, uh, Dustin Wolf did it two years at eight fifty. So he's, it's not like he's a franchise goaltender, but um, that don't forget this signing too that they uh, signed uh, Sharon Govich. To a five year, 5.75 contract. That'll take him till he's 31 years of age. So, um, there, you know, we've said it before and I'm sure they're saying it. They're in a rebuild process, uh, in Calgary. Um, there's no reason for them to go out and try to grab high profile free agents at this stage. Uh, they need to just keep developing young players. Uh, like to be honest with you, other than Toronto, most Canadian teams have to go that direction. They're taking in Canadian dollars at the gate and they're paying out American dollars to the players. For those of you that don't know, there's a 35% difference. So you go up to Canada with a $10 bill from the United States and it's worth 1350 when you get up there. So, um, you know, that, that that's, it's tough on the Canadian teams with that discrepancy in the dollar. And it's interesting that you noted how quiet they were on the free agent front because they have about $20 million of cap space. But if you're in a full-blown retool, why are you going to pay the big dollars right now? And also, it's going to be time for a couple of other veterans to step up, you know, namely Nazem Kadri and probably the biggest disappointment, Jonathan Huberto, who came in, the massive deal involving uh, Matthew Kachuk uh, with Florida a couple of years back. And just to kind of underscore how south this has gone, he had 115 points in 80 games for Florida in 2021-22. He's played 160 games with Calgary and has 107 points in the two seasons combined. So, again, you know, uh, I, I don't think there's a lot of upside for this club this year, and they do have a new arena. The Saddle Dome is being replaced, and perhaps they will be competitive again by the fall of 2027 when their new building, Scotia Place, opens up. One note is that Ryan Lomberg, uh, when he was signed this summer, immediately said, that he w is looking forward to getting back to play with Jonathan Huberto and see uh, Huberto's game go up and and get uh, get out of him uh, what he really has. And he's a big fan and a great teammate of uh, Ryan Lumberg. So it'll be interesting to see if if you know Huberto didn't want to leave Florida. He was pissed off when they traded him to Calgary. Uh, whereas Matthew Kachuk wanted to go to Florida. And I'm, that's that's a big difference. You know, you, you can think about it. You're in Fort Lauderdale. Your family's in Fort Lauderdale. Suddenly they tell you you're going to Calgary, Alberta, almost the opposite of Florida. And Matthew Kachuk, who had said, you better trade me because I'm not going to re-sign with you here in Calgary. And I'd like to be in Florida, ends up being traded to Florida. So um, I, I'm interested to see if Ryan Lumberg can get Jonathan Huberto back on his game. Um, me as well. And uh, one player I just wanted to mention, their first pick uh, in the draft this year, Zach, uh, Zane Parekh, uh, who's the CHL Defenseman of the Year, but still only 18 years old. You really don't want to throw a player that is being compared to Eric Carlson. You don't want to throw him in the fire that quickly and uh, probably would be well served playing another year in junior. And especially not on a rebuilding team because... You know, is that going to do him any good getting beaten all the time? Uh, I don't think so. I think he'd be better off in junior. I've never seen him play, so I'm not saying that from that. But uh, I think that that's where uh, Craig Conroy uh, will end up uh, with um, uh, with Don Maloney and that decision. 
The Seattle Kraken missed the playoffs last year, coming in sixth place, 81 points. Dave Haxtell probably taking the fall for the success that they had in 22-23 when they beat Colorado in seven games and then took Dallas to seven before bowing out. So uh, their notable signings, uh, Brandon Montour and Josh Mohur, defenseman from Florida, and Chandler Stevenson, as the uh, UFA from Vegas. So there's some championship pedigree right there. Eli Tolvanen re-signed with the club and probably the biggest uh, notable signing was the re-sign of Marty Beniers, despite the fact that his production dropped off a little bit last season. Uh, lost uh, to this roster, Thomas Tatar, UFA, goes to Jersey. Chris Drager, backup goaltender, uh, UFA to Florida and Devin Shore, a center, is off to Minnesota. And players that, uh, as of today, are unsigned, Pierre Edward Belmar, Justin Schultz, and Kyler Yamamoto. So um, one of the other interesting pieces of news here, Neil, is the coaching staff with Dan Bosma uh, taking over for Hackstall. Uh, last time he coached in the NHL, 2016-17 with Buffalo. The last two seasons, he's been with Coachella Valley in the AHL, and he is going to be joined by Jessica Campbell, who will be the first female behind an NHL bench this coming season. Yeah, and we know Dan Bilesma has got a, a, a really good port, uh, uh, resume from his days in Pittsburgh, where he came in and actually won the Stanley Cup as a rookie coach, rookie head coach, having been brought up to that team, and uh, is one of many coaches that uh, couldn't get it done in Buffalo. Uh, so you can't single him out for that because there's been 13 years of not getting it done in Buffalo. Um so he goes to Seattle. Uh, I, I, I thought Hextall did a good job, probably got them to overachieve, like you said, uh, and when they beat Colorado in seven and then went to against to seven against Dallas. Um, I want to note that Brandon Montour is 30 years old, as is Chandler Stevenson. So they both got seven year contracts, which are not going to age well. Uh, when these guys are going to be hitting 37 in the last year of the contract. However, if you're in Seattle, I guess you're more worried about today. And if you have to, you buy them out later. Club scored 72 fewer goals than they did in 22-23. Jared McCann, who had a 40-goal season, dropped off to 29. And Marty Beniers, as we mentioned, had 24 and then dropped off to 15 last season. Overall, I think this is a pretty decent forward group. Uh, Oliver Bjorkstrand has showed some real signs of being an excellent player. Jordan Emberley, uh, Yanni Gore. These are some quality forwards up front and, you know, probably good reason why they made the second round two seasons ago. I think the defense is adequate. It's not exceptional, led by Vince Dunn and Adam Larson. Uh, I like uh, the addition of Montour, along with uh, having uh, the mainstay Jamie Alexiak there. And now it's going to be Decord and Grubauer as the two goaltenders. So, again, I think the four group has promise. Defense and goaltending Adequate, but not spectacular. And Dan Bilesma will have to do what Hackstall did two years ago and get this group to overachieve. Maybe not by as much as Hackstall had to get him to do it, but he's a new voice and Danny's going to have to get them to overachieve in order to have a sniff of a chance at getting into one of those wild card spots. What is going on in Anaheim? They are $21.72 million dollars under the cap, and they had no notable signings. Uh, their biggest acquisitions were Robbie Fabry uh, via trade with Detroit and won the Cup in St. Louis in 2019. And Brian Dumoulin comes in from Seattle. He won the Cup with Pittsburgh in 2016 and 2017. And I think maybe the most notable thing that we really saw during the offseason was the draft of Beckett Seneca, who was third overall when he was projected to be 13th by central scouting and just his reaction was pretty remarkable. I mean, he did have 
uh, 68 points in 63 games for Oshawa, including 23 points in the postseason. But there's not really a lot here in terms of trying to bolster this lineup. They do have some good young talent in Leo Carlson, Cutter Gauthier, Troy Terry, Mason McTavish. We're going to get to Trevor Zegras more in a second. But in terms of these signings, you know, you look back a year ago, they signed Radko Gudis from Florida and Alex Kalorn from Tampa. But it seems that there's a pretty big gap in terms of established forwards and support players. And I have no idea where this team is going. No, this is an obvious rebuild. Pat Verbeek is taking his time. He's a new general manager, really. I mean, he's only been there two seasons, I believe. And um, obviously, they want to uh, do a slow re- rebuild because uh, the owners there, um, Henry and Susan Samueli, have more money than they need. And um, they could easily pay to ice uh, whatever team they want to uh, from those that are available. He, he got Robbie Fabry from Stevie Eiserman in Detroit that he's very familiar with him because he used to be in Detroit with Steve. So, um, and he might've got wanted him too because he's won a Stanley cup. Uh, and uh, so it never hurts to have Stanley cup winners in your locker room. The biggest thing, biggest guy they signed in my view was uh the mighty duck they brought him back uh and put him on the front of the jersey now their jerseys have that cartoon character on the front of their jerseys again um after going so many years with a, a d that looked like a web foot from a duck they've sh- they've gone back to the triangle and the uh the uh mighty duck face on the front of there. And I guess they'll bring back um, the mighty duck mascot that comes down out of the ceiling in the games in that beautiful arena they play in. Well, they're going to need a little bit more magic than that. And, you know, um, let's talk about just two players uh, on opposite side of the offensive pop here. Frank Vitrano had a really excellent year last year. And I do think that's the one piece of true veteran presence that they have on the offensive side of the puck. But I mentioned I wanted to talk about Trevor Zegras had a pair of 23 goal seasons his first two years in the league, dropped off to six and 31 games last year. It was an injury riddled year, but he's also come under a lot of ridicule just for his willingness to engage his toughness. And to me, this may be the ultimate sizzle and no stake player in the league. And I maintain that the worst thing that happened to him was in his rookie season scoring three or four Michigan goals because that became his identity. And it was something that he was labeled with early on. The expectations came with that. And he has frankly just not been able to live up to them. No, he hasn't been able to live up to his billing. And I remember when he, when he, um, the first one that he did in Buffalo, where he actually passed it over top of the net to his teammate who batted it in, uh, to the Buffalo, uh, net. Um, and I remember, uh, John Tortorella, the now coach of Philadelphia Flyers being on TV back then and criticizing, uh, that whole thing. And then John took a lot of ridicule because, of course, today's generation likes this kind of stuff. It's a, TikTok generation and they love that. But I think Trevor Zegers is not able to perform to the level expected of him. A, he's on a team that's rebuilding and B, he's just a little guy that uh, is, is very skilled, but I'm not sure that, um, you know, he, he had injuries last year. I'm not sure physically he's ever going to be that star player that uh, uh, the fans and the Ducks were hoping for. If you're Pat Verbeek, how much rope do you give him this year? Oh, I don't. I, I think you give him a lot of rope because, you know, you're rebuilding the team. So it's it's not like, you know, come on, Trevor, we, we you know, we got to get into the playoffs this year. I mean, I in my opinion, I think they are um, trying to get into the lottery for first overall. Uh, I don't see how anybody could see it any other way. Last team that we're going to tackle here are the San Jose Sharks. New head coach, Ryan Orsovsky. Five straight playoff misses and it combined 76 games under 500. Their key signings, Alex Winberg from New York. Uh, that's the Rangers. Uh, Tyler Toffoli comes in from Winnipeg. Uh, they re-sign uh, Ty Emerson and Harry Thrun. 
and they uh, acquire Barkley Goodrow via the waiver wire from the New York Rangers by trade. They get Ty uh, Delandria from Dallas, Carl Gunstrom from uh, Gruntrum, rather from the Los Angeles Kings. Uh, Jake Wallman from Detroit. And we had mentioned in the Central Division, Summer Cooler, acquiring Yaroslav Askarov, a highly uh, regarded prospect from Nashville. Uh, didn't really lose too much off their roster. Uh, Kyle Burrows uh, was uh, traded off to Los Angeles. But really, the big news out of San Jose, the number one overall pick, Penciled in is the number one center, Malcolm Celebrini. Yeah, that is the big news. And that's uh, the that's the Bedard summer. I mean, Chicago got it the summer before. Now Celebrini comes in and is going to be their future. And I'm sure they're going to market the Sharks around Celebrini. Um, Tyler Toffoli, I, I was surprised that he went there this late in his career and signed a four-year deal at $6 million a year. Um could end up that he never makes the playoffs again in, in San Jose. Um, Alex Wenberg, uh, I saw him play for the Rangers quite a bit last year. And uh, if he's a $5 million player, well, then I'm a little bit surprised at that. Barkley Goodrow will give them some real good leadership. Um, he That's the kind of guy he is, and uh, he will be missed in New York. But San Jose and Anaheim are going to battle it out. Uh, to see if they can get the next uh, Bedard, uh, Celebrini, whoever, in uh, 2025. Six foot, 190. He's also smallish. Uh, not as small as uh, Bedard, but still, you know, going to have a lot of traffic to go through with these bigger NHL teams and the forwards that he's going to be facing. Comes out of BU as a Hobie Baker winner. Um what is the expectation here? Because Bedard came in the same way, really bad team last year. Perhaps Chicago is maybe gets a little bit of an uptick. What's the real, the realistic projection for this team to become respectable again? For the, for that one player, Celebrini, I would think that it's to be no, just just for the team in general, but with him leading. Leading their show. Well, first of all, they'll be rebuilding. hoping that Celebrini is a rookie of the year, uh, Calder Trophy winner, because that means that they've got what they were hoping to get at first overall. Um, I think all you want to see in this team is some progress is, is to get a little bit better. You've got a new coach, only 35 years old. You're going to evaluate him and then you're going to evaluate where are we as far as our rebuild program goes. Obviously last year they were, um, somewhere out in the parking lot. Uh, this year, they'll try to get into the building. I want to talk about Worsovsky before we wrap up here. He served two years in assistant uh, under David Quinn. Do you like a rookie head coach coming into this rebuild, or should the club and most specifically GM Mike Greer headed to, to the recycle bit instead and maybe get a more established head coach? You know, it's a hard call. Uh, I think that uh, uh, he knows this this uh, young guy. He's only 35. He knows him very well, Mike Greer does. And so he knows uh, what abilities he has. I've always um, wondered w why you fire David Quinn and then make his assistant the head coach if that guy was learning under David Quinn. But I might be wrong on that. Maybe he saw something in him and and there might also be a budget reason. Maybe he's not making a ton of money to take that job and he's going to have um, he'll get two or three years just like David Quinn and then they'll go on to the next guy. Um David Quinn had no chance right from the get-go when he took that job. Just no chance at all. And um, I feel bad for him because he is a good guy and he is a good coach. And I think there's probably little question that as we wrap up the 32 teams, it will be between Anaheim, San Jose, and Columbus for that first overall pick in the 2025 NHL entry draft. 
This is the human side of the story brought to you by the Game 7 Group. And right at the top of our show, we touched on the Edmonton Oilers. Magical run through the playoffs last year. Came back from three games down to even their final round series against the Florida Panthers before finally falling in that seventh game. But they certainly created a lot of magic because Game 7 has a magic attached to it like nothing in sport. In order to prevail, teamwork is essential to achieving success. At the Game 7 Group, transforming individuals into cohesive teams is the core philosophy in their team-building approach. Their belief is every team has potential to achieve extraordinary results. Game 7 Group offers various services to help teams accomplish their goals through specific team-building events, coaching, and speaking engagements. These services are aimed at improving team dynamics, productivity, and overall performance. Face it, we all want to be able to succeed in the big moment. Check out the Game 7 Group website at game7group.com slash NHL Wraparound to learn more. Right now, a special incentive offer awaits our podcast listeners. Take your team to the next step. The Game 7 Group will get you there. And so, Neil, now that we have gone through the entire Pacific division. You want to be a head coach? Yeah. What stands out to me in the Pacific division, Vic, is the uh, human side to the coaching fraternity. And uh, when I'm going to run through these teams in the Pacific division in alphabetical order, not in the uh, order of their standings and talk about each of their head coaches. And remember, these head coaches have families, they have kids, they move on site, obviously. And, um, but it's a dangerous occupation. In Anaheim, Greg Cronin is back for his second year behind the bench for the Anaheim Ducks, 61 years of age. In Calgary, in his first year, Ryan Huska, uh, 49-year-old coach uh, in his first year in Calgary as the head coach. Um, we mentioned earlier when we did Edmonton that Chris Knobloch is back, but this will be his first full year as head coach. He's 45. In L.A., Jim Hiller comes back is re-signed after uh getting um, being a mid-season replacement last year um he comes back for his first full year at 55 years old we just finished mentioning the youngest guy the the junior of the group is Ryan uh Warsawski he starts his first year as the head coach of San Jose at 36 years old in Seattle. Dan Bilesma comes in to be the first year in Seattle. Um, he is 53 years old in Vancouver. Rick Tockett starts his second full year. He's been there for he, this will be his third uh, part of season because he came halfway through two years ago and he is 60 years old. Rick talk it hard to believe. Uh, but, and then in Vegas, Bruce Cassidy comes back for his third season with the uh, Golden Knights, having won the Stanley Cup in the first year with the Golden Knights after having been fired by the Boston Bruins. He's 59 years old. So when you think about the longest tenured coach in that division is going into his third season. That's it. He's only going into his third season. A lot of first year guys. It's a profession that, um, well, to say it has high turnover would sort of be an understatement, but uh, when you, when you look at it though, and, and you really got to go and, and do your research, man, oh man, they, there's a lot of new coaches, particularly in the Pacific division. And I think what's interesting is what we see in the Pacific Division for this season. We may very well have this exact same conversation, but it will be either in the Atlantic, the Metro, or the Central for before we get ready for the 25-26 season. You're right about that. And that will wrap up our series of NHL Summer Coolers. Thank you to the Game 7 Group for sponsoring us. And with the new season approaching, new sponsorship opportunities are available. So please join our team. You can reach us at NHLWraparound.com, where all of our episodes are available on both audio and video platforms. Thank you to our listeners. As always, we can't do it without you. Send questions or comments to NHLWraparound at gmail.com. 
Tom. And now that our summer cooler series is complete, once we get to the other side of Labor Day, we are only two weeks away from the start of training camps and all 32 teams getting back at it. We will see you in September. Thanks for joining us on the NHL Wraparound Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date on all the NHL action.